Welcome back everybody. In this video, I'm going to attempt to cover a bunch of functional programming fundamental concepts in one video. With the goal being to explain that it's not Haskell that's difficult. Haskell is quite easy, at least to get started with. But functional programming is what's difficult. So, let's dive in. Now, the first thing to understand with functional programming is that it differs in how it approaches data from other uh, programming languages or other programming paradigms. So, we often think of programs as having data and then functions that operate on that data. But in functional programming and in functional programming languages like Haskell, functions are treated as data. That means that you can pass functions as arguments to other functions because functions and data are treated as exactly the same thing. So here I'll show you that functions are in fact data. So if I make a function called six and all it does is return six and then I ask the Haskell uh, interpreter here is six equal to the function that returns six? True, it is. And it's because that function is equal to the data that it returns. So if the function is data. And if you are familiar at all with the filter method in JavaScript or the concept of filtering a list in any other language, you'll understand that filter takes a predicate function. And that can only happen if functions are data. So if I have the filter function in Haskell, and I want only the odd values from a list, odd is a function, but it's being passed to another function. This is where it's called a predicate function. And if functions had to operate on data, then you couldn't pass in a function without it being data, because a if, if a function requires data and a function isn't data, you can't pass a function in. So functions have to be data if you're going to be passing them around with the other data. And there we go, we get just the odd values from a list of 1 to 10. So that should hopefully show you that functions are data, but if functions are data and data is data, then data should also be functions. It sounds counterintuitive, but let me show you how that works. So if I had a function called add2, and it took two values, an x and a y, those are going to be numbers, and all it does is add them together, x plus y. And what it might look like is that we have a function called add2 that takes a number and a second number, and then adds them together to produce a new number. And if we look at the type signature for this guy, it's kind of what it looks like. But you'll notice that there's actually not a list of two, par or two uh, function, or, or, uh, function parameters. It's a, taking a type of A, return, then take, in returning a function that takes another type of A, and then returning a function that takes another type, or that returns a function of type A. So, what's actually happening here is we have a function called add2 that takes some data. That data, in this case, needs to be of the number type, and it returns a function that's expecting another value. And that second value is also going to be a number in this case, that's why it's all A's all the way through here. And then it's going to return that number plus that second number. So first of all, I'll just show you that it works. If I do add 2, and then I add 7 and 8 together, we get 15. All right, that's fair. But let me show you that if we pass in just one value, this value is actually a function that's waiting for a second value. So if I do add 7, and I assign that add 7 uh, variable name, to the value of add2 with 7 applied, no errors are thrown. And now, if I do type of add7, you'll see that it's a function 
that's waiting for a second value so that it can return a value of that same type. So if I do add 7 and 8, I will get 15. And if I were to do uh, 15 equals add 7 and 8, it's going to be true because functions are data and data is a function. So what's happened here is what's called currying where we pass in one value to a function that's expecting more than one value as its arguments. So we have created a new function called add7 by passing just 7 into add2, even though it was still waiting for another number. And then add7 is going to wait for that second number until I pass again. That's another fundamental pr uh, concept in functional programming. Currying. Now, the next fundamental concept is immutable data. If I create a array, I'm going to actually name it this time, call it nums. It's going to be 1 through 10. And if we look at nums, it is all the values of 1 to 10. And if I use that same example from above of filter, and I just pass in odd, and I pass in nums, I get all the odd numbers back. But if I look at nums, nums is still intact. I have not changed anything about the nums list. What I have done is received a new list in return. My apologies if I've said array a few times. I'm sure I have. It's the problem with making a lot of JavaScript-specific videos. Uh, and so you're not able to actually operate on data in place in functional programming languages, or at least the ones that use immutable data, which they generally should, and which Haskell does. You are always going to get new data back. So the example I've heard a few times is if you had a bank account, and you were going to withdraw money from that bank account, you would actually not withdraw money directly from that value. You would get a new value, which was the difference between the original value, the value that you removed, and then you would have a new value that replaces the old value as the current bank account balance. You don't actually operate directly on the data, you operate with the data and return new data. And that's because functions in functional programming are just input and output. So they receive an input and they give you an output. And it always should be that same output. You want them to be what's called referentially transparent where you give it a value. So if I take add 7 and I apply, I, I apply the value of 8 to it, it's always going to be 15. If sometimes it's 16 and sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 15, then it's not referentially transparent. So that's an important thing. One last thing that's important to cover is something that I've danced around a little bit, which is the type system. So. Types in a strictly typed language like Haskell, or, or statically typed, sorry, language like Haskell, are very, very important because the compiler is extremely strict. So if you pass a multi-dimensional list to a function that's expecting a single-dimensioned list, so a flat list, then it will immediately just throw an error. It's not going to do like you might see in a language like JavaScript, where it will try its best, and then you'll just end up with a bunch of undefines or weird values. It simply looks at something like this, the type signature, and says, all right, we're expecting a single value that is of the num type, and then we're just going to give you back another value of the same type. And if you don't give us that, we're going to throw an error, and we're not going to compile. And the way that Haskell works when you're not in the interpreter is you will actually compile your programs into a executable. So I'll show you an example of that here. I have a program called run.hs, and this takes all the values in a list and recursively adds them up. There's already this functionality in the sum function that's baked into Haskell, but this serves as a decent example. And so what we have here is some pattern matching, and, it, and like I said, it mentions, or it uh, 
is an example of recursion. And recursion is the last principle that I want to cover in this very rapid fire video. In recursion, part of the solution that the function uses to it, uh, solve a problem involves calling itself. So what we have here is a function called sum list that takes either an empty list and returns zero because the sum of an empty list is going to just be zero. At least I have determined it should be that. It might, you might decide it throws an error, but I want it to be zero. If it gets a single value in the list, then the sum of that list is just that value. So if it just gets a list that's five, then the sum of five is five. So you just give it back. And if it gets anything other than that, it will take the first value and add that to the rest of the list applied to some list. So if it was three and four, it's going to be three plus a list with the value four in it, which will go up here, match with the single valued pattern, and it will return four, which will then be three plus four, and it will give us seven. In this case, we are applying it through to this list of one through 10, so it will add up all those values, and the last value that it gets will be, uh, I think, 45 plus uh, an array of 10, or sorry, a list of 10, which will just return 10. It'll be 45 plus 10. So the way that we can execute that oops, is by clicking run, and we get 55, which is the sum of all the values from 1 to 10. So if I go here... Like I said, this is already baked into Haskell, and you can do it like this. So that was a crazy rapid fire introduction to a bunch of the functionality or a bunch of the fundamental concepts in a functional programming language. I plan on diving deeper into each of those individually, but this is a way for me to get my feet wet with talking about these concepts and maybe to introduce you to some of the different concepts that you might want to learn about if you're curious about how exactly functional programming compares to uh, other programming paradigms, like imperative programming. So I hope this gave you some insight if you're completely unfamiliar with functional to functional programming. Uh, if you are completely unfamiliar, you're probably incredibly confused. Thanks for sticking into this point. If you liked the video, like the video. It does help me get some more traffic to the channel. Comment down below for what you'd like to see in the future. I would love to dive more into Haskell videos, and I plan on doing that. Let me know if comparing JavaScript functionality to Haskell functionality side by side would be useful. It's something I'm playing with as an idea. I'll see you guys in the next video. And have a great day. Bye.